Today on A Better Way, we'll have a food price outlook for the months ahead and offer some suggestions on managing your food budget in 1980. We'll take a look at how the telephone presently and in the future can help to conserve energy. And Agriculture Secretary Bob Bergland will comment on the future economic and social structure of American agriculture. For our young viewers, we'll look at soil, the foundation of life. Nuts are not only tasty, but nutritious. We'll offer some tips on using them in your family meals. Finally, we'll visit a U.S. trade fair in Japan, next on A Better Way. Welcome to A Better Way. My name is Don Elder. Most of us are acutely aware of inflation every time we go through the checkout line at the grocery store. For an idea of what we can expect in the way of food prices in 1980, Larry Quinn has this report. Inflation will continue to be a major concern for consumers in the year ahead. Food prices will average about 11% higher in 1979 than they were in 1978. That's about the same as the general inflation rate for the year. With us to take a look at food prices in the year ahead is Dawson Ahalt of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Dawson is chairman of the World Food and Agricultural Outlook and Situation Board. And Dawson, as we begin to think and look, about, uh, look at 1980, what do you see for food prices? Larry, we see the inflationary pressures uh, that are permeating our economy, pushing up the cost of food at the retail counter uh, in 1980. We expect food prices in the year ahead to average somewhere between 11, between 7 and 11 percent higher than they did in the current year. Most of that increase will be due to inflation itself as it pushes up the cost of processing and marketing food after it leaves the farm gate. So what will account for most of those food costs? You said inflationary factors, but uh, will farm prices increase that much? Will it be marketing costs? What will? The main uh, source of the increase will be increased marketing costs. The largest component there is labor, but higher prices for energy, packaging, transportation, all of the, uh, of the cost of moving food after it leaves the farm uh, gets added in and uh, is going to be the main source of the increase uh, as we look at the year ahead. What about the pattern of food price increases for this coming year? Will we see about the same as we've had this past year or will it be somewhat different? At this stage, we look for a much different pattern uh, in 1980. Uh, right now, we are seeing record levels of pork and poultry production. We expect that pattern to continue into next year, uh, running at very large levels. Uh, through the first half of the year. Thus, consumers should be able to get very good buys on those products in the first half of the year, uh, while in the second half, uh, by that time, producers having been squeezed by, uh, by the inflationary pressures that are, that are above their, their uh, returns, will have made adjustments and, and meat supplies will perhaps be much tighter in the second half of the year. So perhaps a consumer will be filling up their freezers with meat during the six, first six months of the year. I believe that would be a good uh, uh, strategy for consumers to follow, particularly with, uh, with purchases of pork and poultry meat in the first half of 1980. What about the, the red meats? Uh, what do you see there for 1980? Beef prices will average higher uh, in the year ahead. Supplies will be about as large as uh, they have been uh, in 1979. But we don't expect to see as, uh, as much of an increase in, uh, in beef that, uh, as we do in, uh, in uh, 
pork and poultry. Let's talk about a couple of other basics, that of milk and eggs. What do you see there? Eggs should continue to be a good buy next year uh, based on uh, our supply uh, prospects at this stage. Uh, however, dairy products are going to continue to go up uh, uh, perhaps not much different than the overall rate of inflation. Breads and cereals? Breads and cereals will increase uh, roughly in line with uh, the overall rate of inflation because those products are uh, are uh, highly processed and labor packaging costs get built in uh, uh, to those items uh, as they move to the to the retail counter. What's the outlook for fruits and vegetables? Fruits and vegetables have been a good buy uh, this fall because we've generally had uh, good crops. We're having a record citrus crop uh, coming on, uh, lots of oranges uh, uh, coming out of uh, Florida this season. So uh, we expect particularly the fruit crop uh, to be uh, quite large and, uh, and, some, and some pretty good buys in, in some of those products. What about in the area of something like oils and sweeteners that we all use? The vegetable oil situation uh, uh, is a bit uncertain at the moment, uh, partly due to the fact that the monsoon was erratic in India this year, and India is the world's largest importer of uh, vegetable oils. That could have some effect on the cost of oils uh, available for consumers in this country. Uh, we don't expect to see any big increase there. but. Uh, uh, perhaps a perhaps a modest rise over the current year. Uh, prices for uh, sugars and sweeteners will move up uh, pretty much in line, we think, with the uh, with the rate of, uh, of of the general rate of increase in food prices. What are the basic factors that could quickly alter just what we've been talking about uh, the food price outlook? It does change rather quickly sometimes. Well, food supplies, of course, are vulnerable to sudden changes in weather, and we have had two very bad winters the past two years, Larry, as you know. We're sure hoping that we get through this uh, year without uh, uh, an unusually cold weather, and also we hope we can avoid getting a, a cold snap either in Florida or California in the winter months w because we depend on those states for the bulk of our produce uh, during uh, that season of the year. Weather is an important factor and can uh, uh, inhibit farmers' ability to move their livestock to market, which can tighten up supplies uh, quickly in the short run. What tips would you give a consumer that might help them manage their food budget for this coming year? Well, consumers will have to continue to, uh, to look for the best buys and to take advantage of the, uh, of the specials that, uh, that stores are offering. If you look at the ads, you see wide uh, divergences in prices among products at the various stores. Uh, it's getting more costly to shop from store to store, but uh, you still can take advantage of specials that stores are offering uh, each week. That's what I think uh, consumers need to look for. Dawson A. Hall, Chairman of the World Food and Agricultural Outlook and Situation Board for the Department of Agriculture. Most of us are probably familiar with that slogan uh, made famous by the Yellow Pages called, Let Your Fingers Do the Walking. Well, when that slogan came into use about 20 years ago, even then the idea was energy conservation. Well, I guess has some thoughts on how today's telephone service can help to conserve energy. Joel Babb is with the USDA's Rural Electrification Administration. Joel, what are some of the ways that the telephone can uh, cut down on using gasoline and other types of energy? Well, I, I think we've got to take that old slogan, let your fingers do the walking, and go just a little bit further than what the slogan was probably originally designed for. The slogan was probably designed to sell yellow page advertising and to uh, help the shoppers uh, locate the uh, uh, items that they wanted to buy. But I think with today that with our energy conservation that we have, and I would like to say that uh, our agency, the Rural Electrification, is certainly interested in conservation. We're primarily in the electric program, but yet uh, a lot of people don't know of our telephone program, but we are vitally interested in both of these uh, energy conservations in it. The ways that we can save it is that we're going to have to change some of our habits probably from we want to talk to mother or we want to go across town or we want to go look and see something or we want to go find out if something is there, we, we should stop and think and stop, well, do we really need to take this trip or should we pick up the telephone 
and do our visiting with a telephone. I think I would prefer to call around to different stores to find out they have the item than, than to just take the time and go look for it anyway. That's true, and you know, Don, we might think that uh, just this one little trip won't count, but yet we uh, have made loans to probably 4.4 uh, million uh, rural telephone subscribers, and if we could just save a mile a day, how much energy would that be in a year's time? Sure, even a mile a month with a 4 mile. million people would be amazing. That, that's, that is, that is quite amazing. Outside of, of, of the obvious, the, the idea of using the telephone rather than getting in your car and driving around or, or verifying that indeed a store has what you're looking for, uh, what are, are some of the new features um, uh, offered uh, through telephone service, uh, not only in rural communities but in our urban suburban areas that are oriented toward energy conservation? Well, the rural the, with the telephone are, uh, should be well pleased because they can get the same features as the people in the ur urban areas. And uh, they're coming with, with many things. We've gone a long ways from the old uh, uh, crank telephone system and the two, uh, two longs and three shorts with the 12 or 14 people on the line. Today, we've got many, many of our... Sometimes uh, you had 12 and 14 people on the line at once, oh, too, oh, in those days. We certainly did. Uh, in fact, I made a call the other day, and it was to a five long distance, and the operator says, well, we got four of the other, other parties, but we couldn't get the one you, you wanted to see. But we <laughs> don't have that today because we can. Uh, we, we, we do have many of them with the one party. I, I think that our features that we are, are going to have and, and uh, as I say there, that we can come, that we have the same as in the urban and the rural is uh, we have uh, uh, call transfer. Call transfer is this, if you want to go, if some uh, housewife wants to go visit her mother, she can transfer calls over there. If a business feels that they have some very important calls coming in, they can transfer their calls to the house when they go to lunch and that we have call waiting. The call waiting is you'll receive a little buzzer or a little beep or a little tone signal and you can push one button on your telephone and uh, transfer your call to the incoming call when you're through with that pushback and get the, get the other party that you uh, were talking to. It also gives you an excuse to break off a long-winded telephone conversation well, too. <laughs> if you need an excuse, yes. The other thing is, uh, in addition to that, is conference calling, that uh, maybe you have a couple of friends that you want to talk. You can call, uh, uh, you don't have to just call one person, you can call two people. We've gone into the automatic uh, uh, dialing with the uh, DDD uh, today in almost any parts of the country. I think you and I were just discussing, and both of us got in our telephone bill, and then we can dial direct to 74 foreign countries. And uh, these are some of the things that are coming down the pike. Joel, what about some of the features uh, outside of telephone conversations that, that many uh, telephone uh, customers might not be familiar with, uh, some I, of the data transfer? I, uh, I think the, the greatest move that I see in the telephone industry is the use of the computer. We're using the computer inside of the, the telephone end, but I think the computer is going to be coming into the home and be used into the home. I think we're going to be doing a tremendous amount of our purchasing with a computer. Uh, many times today that you will call up and you'll ask, do you have a certain item at the store? It'll take a long time to get a clerk, and then the clerk will have to go search. Um, in some places, you can call up and, uh, the, on your own telephone if you have a, a, a terminal or a data set in your home, uh, put it into the cradle, uh, uh, get access to the computer, and the computer can tell you what's available. And uh, you can do, you're going to be able to do your purchasing with a computer. You're going to be able to do price comparison with a computer and many, many more things with a computer. Well, that is real energy conservation when you figure the amount of, amount of uh, gasoline that will be wasted just in the trips to the bank and to That's the store. Right. And now, we serve uh, many, many rural areas, and I think that one of the uh, very important uh, things in the rural area is going to be then the medicine. Because uh, we, we might not have the, uh, all the expertise with the doctors and the uh, fancy equipment that we have, uh, today we do have, um, we can hook up an EKG and you can be in one place and a doctor can 2,000 miles away, an expert can be uh, sitting and making an analysis of that EKG from somebody in a little hospital way out in uh, some far place in the country. And this is something we have today using the existing we, telephone lines. We have lines. that today uh, using existing telephone lines. We do have the, the uh, slow scan uh, x-ray transfers, uh, transferring x-rays so that the x-rays can be analyzed real quick. But I think that with the medicine that's coming along with the computer that we are going to be able to use that computer in the telemedicine, and that is going to be one of the most important or, or going to become very, very important, especially in the rural areas. One final question that really isn't directly related to this but is important. Um, many urban suburban telephone lines are now buried underground. 
What advice do you have or precautions uh, for the homeowner that well, they should be aware of? Well, it's, it's very unfortunate that where they used to, where, probably where the telephone company wants to bury their line is probably where that homeowner wants to put his mailbox. And you start digging down to put that mailbox and you, you can cut that, uh, cut that cable. Now, they buried the cable and there's usually signs up there and when you do cut that cable, you're cutting your own cable plus you're cutting your cable from all the people around you. I've seen them put in fence rows, and the fence rows, are, it just so happens that you wanted to put the fence row right down where the cable is. In fact, it gets very expensive, uh, not from the standpoint of maybe just coming out and fixing it, but uh, some of these cables carry a tremendous amount of uh, volume of uh, business. I had one friend that was out uh, demonstrating a backhoe, and he cut the cable, and just for the loss of business until they could switch that, it cost him about $42,000. Don't cut the cable. Thanks very much, Joel Babb with the Rural Electrification Administration being with us, taking a look at the telephone as an energy conservation tool. Today on A Better Way for Kids, we begin a new three-part series on soil and why it's important to us. Hi, I'm Tom Leverman with the Soil Conservation Service. You've all heard the word soil. You probably see soil every day. But how much do you really know about soil, about its development, how humans use it, and abuse it. This little bit of soil is in a way a piece of history, the result of natural processes that began thousands of years ago and continue even today. Soil isn't all the same. Here are two examples of soil, both from Maryland. It's quite easy to see the difference between these two soils. The Chillum has a very shallow topsoil indicated by the dark Soil, colored soil which is about three and a half inches deep. The color from the topsoil down is nearly the same. At about 29 inches, rocks are found. The Hagerstown silt loam has a dark brown layer about nine and a half to 10 inches deep. There are a few small pebbles found in this layer. Notice the distinct color change between the first layer, the topsoil, and the subsoil. The color is about the same all the way down until we get to the bottom where we find some large rocks. This is about 36 inches deep. These are only two examples of the nearly 70,000 soils found in the United States. That's right, 70,000 different soils. Now here's a quick two-question quiz to test your knowledge of soil. Question number one. Soil is made from rocks, plants, animals, glaciers, or all of the above. The process to manufacture soil is extremely complicated. Every activity of nature, including glaciers, which slowly moved across the land to the death and decay of plant and animal life, all have a part in creating the material we call soil. Question two, which of the following is found in soil? Sand, silt, clay, air, or all of the above? A close investigation of soil reveals a great diversity of materials. The primary building blocks of soil are sand, silt, and finally clay. The thin layer of soil that covers the Earth's surface ranges from just a few inches to four or five feet in depth. The soil is where all human and natural forces eventually meet. On the soil, we grow crops, build highways, homes, and businesses. The soil is the foundation of our lives. We're in an electron microscope lab. On the screen, you can see grains of sand magnified 100 times. Now I'll zoom the lens in closer, and you can see the grains of sand magnified 1,000 times their original size. And once again, I'll zoom the lens in closer, and you'll see the grains of sand magnified 10,000 times their original size. Soil scientists, people who study soil, say that about 50% of the space in soil is composed of air and moisture. Now, here's another way to take a look at our example of sand. This x-ray machine shows you what the sand is made of. This peak shows the amount of silicon contained in our sample of sand. Oh, well, by the way, how did you do on your soil quiz? The answers to both questions are all of the above. I hope you visit me again to learn more exciting things about soil. 
the holiday season may have left you with a lot of leftover nuts. The eating kind. Nuts contribute rich flavor and a crunchy texture to many kinds of foods. They're not only tasty, but nutritious as well. Nuts in the shell keep well in a nut bowl at room temperature for a short period of time. For prolonged storage, keep them in a cool, dry place. Shelled nuts will keep fresh for several months if you store them in a tightly closed container in the refrigerator. Nuts are filling because of their fat content and may prevent between meal hunger pangs which encourage nibbling. Most common nuts contain about 10 to 25 percent protein and can be an added source of protein in meals. Peanuts are highest in protein with 25 percent. Nuts are versatile and may come to the dinner table in a variety of ways as an ingredient in cooking or as a garnish. If you'd like to find more ways of using nuts in main dishes, soups, salads, and desserts, send for this copy of Nuts and Family Meals. Write to Agriculture TV, Washington, D.C., 20250. Japan is one of the major customers for U.S. food products. Recently, our reporter Wally Dudney visited a United States food fair in Japan. Here's his report. Eating habits are changing in Japan. More Japanese are eating out, and Western-style foods are becoming more popular. This includes many consumer-ready foods from the United States. Sales of these foods to Japan totaled nearly one-half billion dollars last year. To see and sample these products, Japanese food importers gathered in Tokyo for an American Foods exhibition, part of the big international hotel and restaurant show. Phil Holloway, assistant U.S. agricultural attaché in Japan, describes what they saw. In this exhibit, we have at least 50 exhibitors which come from almost all states in the Union. Among them are many uh, fruit and vegetable exhibitors, some of our cooperator organizations, such as the American Soybean Association, the Poultry and Egg Institute of America, the U.S. Meat Export Federation, California Cling Peach Advisory Board, among other uh, organizations here. Buyers attending the show represented all segments of the Japanese food trade. Many of them uh, represent uh, hotel and restaurant trade, but also we have people here from the Japanese school lunch program, from mass feeding units of major Japanese corporations, and uh, other institutional feeders. And uh, we are quite pleased with the quality of the visitor that we are receiving at this show. Japanese food buyers were able to taste a wide range of American foods, many of them new to the Japanese market. Sales of these consumer-ready foods accounted for about 15% of the $4.4 billion of American agricultural products sold to Japan last year. Japan is the number one overseas market for U.S. farm products, but there is strong competition from other countries who are actively promoting their products. Phil Holloway comments on the future of American sales. With the tremendous demand for U.S. consumer-ready food products in Japan, I expect sales to double in the next two years. Wally Dudney reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture from Tokyo. There's a very good chance that you're watching this program on a Japanese-made television set, and you probably listen to a Japanese stereo, and you might use a Japanese camera, or you might be one of the millions of Americans who drive a Japanese automobile. The thing that pay for these imported goods are American agricultural products. You know, in less than 200 years, our nation has developed the most efficient and abundant food production system in the world. We progressed from hand power to horse and ox to complete mechanization. The quality and quantity of our yield increases each year. We feed not only ourselves, but also a substantial part of the rest of this planet. Where do we go from here? What's the future of American agriculture? What are the concerns? Larry Quinn has this report. The economic and social structure of agriculture directly affects all Americans. The income farmers make, the jobs of people in the marketing chain, the quality of life in rural communities, the price of food, even the value of the dollar in foreign trade are affected by our food and agriculture system and how it operates. That means that the consequences of a given farm structure pose critically important issues of public policy. The term structure is an economist word used to describe such things as the number, size, and control of farms, the relationship between farmers and their suppliers and markets, 
and other institutions that make up our food and agriculture system or influence how it operates. Secretary of Agriculture Bob Berglund has called for a dialogue on American agriculture to re-examine the forces which has shaped agriculture as we know it today. A broad-based public discussion of these issues will occur in a series of 10 meetings in late November and December. Agriculture Secretary Berglund outlined areas of concern that will be discussed. Well, looking at uh, trends in uh, land ownership, for example, uh, everyone is uh, concerned about the future of the family farm, and uh, we're going to look uh, carefully at uh, how that uh, farm is uh, situated and what's happening. We uh, know that in the last 10 years, there are about a million families have retired from farming, and during that period, only half a million new starts. Will that be a good or a bad thing if it continues? Uh, we're going to look at then uh, commodity policy, credit policy, and all the rest, uh, including tax policy, to see whether these policies make sense in the long run. There are both social and economic issues involved here. There are. The um, social issues are, um, for example, uh, trying to measure the worth of having a policy in which people are given a chance to own the land they live on. and. Um, we know that a um, hundred years ago with the Homestead Act, uh, that was the root of the policy at that time. Uh, if you lived on the land, you had a chance to own it. And uh, since then, of course, we've um, drifted away from that basic concept. About half the land in the United States is now tenant farmed. Nothing really wrong with that. Uh, but if the in rate tendency towards increased tenancy continues, uh, what then? Will we have uh, land owned by a relative handful? And is this a good thing or a bad thing? Of course, the farmers and the rural citizens have the most at stake in a dialogue on this subject, but we all have something that we can gain from this. Oh, we sure do. Uh, about um, one family in four in the United States lives in a rural place. Now, only about uh, one-fourth of those live on farms, but uh, we are a rural country. And um, so the question of the future of uh, small farming in the country is a, an important issue. One and a half million farms in this country are uh, uh, too small to uh, provide full-time employment for the family, uh, but they have non-farm jobs. And uh, there have been some people who criticize the rural development programs on the grounds that they're either not effective or we don't need it or for whatever reason. And we want to examine the social and economic implications uh, and the role of these small-scale farms in the country. Uh, today, we seem to think in terms of uh, large-scale farming, mechanization, automation, efficiency, and uh, hard-charging output, uh, all of which has uh, served the United States very well. And um, we don't mean to find fault with any of this. We're simply looking to see whether these programs are doing what it is that we want to do. And uh, if the uh, small-scale farming has a role to play in this country, maybe we should uh, design programs to accommodate that need as well. Next week, Agriculture Secretary Bob Berglund will be back with us to discuss the problem of using marginal land. We'll also uh, look at an effort to control, so control soil erosion in western Tennessee. We're going to focus on the importance of soil conservation and how it affects all of us. Debbie Reeder, I didn't realize that there are so many different kinds of peanuts. Oh, or nuts in many, general. many kinds. <laughs> That's it for A Better Way. We'll be back in seven days. Join us. <laughs>